Occasionally on this channel, I get to do a car cave, which is where I'm welcomed into someone's private world of vehicles to have a look around the special things that they've brought into one space and put in their own little private cathedral. And this one is nothing short of eclectic and wonderful. So come with me as we have a look at cars like this. Cars like this. So come with me as we have a really good walk round this incredible car cave on The Late Break Show. This episode is proudly supported by Carly. Before we delve into this glorious car collection tour, you might be wondering what Carly is. Carly is a vehicle diagnostic scanning tool which allows you to view your car's control system and provide a complete overview of your car's health. Plug in the scanner to your OBD2 port, download and open the app on your phone, and via Bluetooth, Carly will reveal manufacturer level diagnostics. I'm in this two year old Audi RS5, which is owned by a friend of the Late Break Show team. Now, I've already plugged the Carly in and it's already run through all the diagnostic system on the app here. So it knows the mileage and it has seven issues apparently. Those issues being when I go into the diagnostics, five issues with the ABS brakes and two issues with the central electronics. Now I can clear those codes, I can investigate them further. If I go into the features, I can actually go to maintenance. And if I wanted to, I could reset the service light if I wanted to take power back and actually service this car myself which is where Carly's smart mechanics step-by-step -step repair guides comes into play, as these tutorials are tailored to your car's specific issue. They will help identify the potential causes and associated symptoms for over 6,000 error codes. I can even reset the learning values of the engine and the automatic gearbox if I wanted. Depending on your car, you can also unlock special features. Now I've gone into the app here for this Audi and there are various things I can do. It always saves a backup of the original settings in case you change your mind. One thing I thought was really cool is I can turn the daytime running lights off if I wanted, which no one would do, but you can turn the tail lights on. So that, that means the tail lights are always running in the daytime as well as the front lights. And there's numerous other things in all kinds of different sections. Carly works with most cars that have an OBD2 port, but the best thing to do is head to mycarly.com to check your car's compatibility. Now, it's back to the car cave. I know you've got multiple car barns. I have a few. <laughs> it's a bit of an illness, Johnny, I'm afraid. It, it, it is an illness. It's a bloody amazing illness, I have Thank to say. You. Before we delve into all these cars, where on earth did this interest Where start? did it start? Well, it, it, it started when I was a, a young lad. My granddad was a mechanic. Um, and he'd repair cars and I'd help him on school holidays. I'd clean the spark plugs, I'd gap them, I'd show him, there we are, granddad, how about that one? He'd look at it, yeah, that's okay, and put it back. So I just, just loved cars. So I pestered my parents, could I, could, I, could I have a car? Could I have a car? Yeah. I was only about 13, I think. And my granddad found me a Riley 1.5. My dad said, no, you can't have it, you're too young. And I cried and cried, why can't I have this car? I was really upset. <laughs> So um, anyway, that sort of died down. I think my dad felt a bit guilty. So he said, oh, all right, then when another one comes along, you can have that. So when I left school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to follow my granddad's footsteps and become a car mechanic. So I left school, didn't take any exams. I think I left school when I was 15. I don't think I told my parents. No. And already had a job lined up for a firm called Andres and Racing and Tuning in Eastleigh. Um, I was an apprentice motor mechanic. Um, on 30 pounds a week, 75 pence an hour, but I, but, I, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I did that for a number of years. Then I went to a few garages in Winchester, uh, working on normal run of the mill cars, changing clutches, servicing, but I got a little bit disillusioned. I thought, hang on, that's not really for me. Yeah. I like old cars. I like classic stuff. I like interesting cars. Yep. So I, I made a decision that once I'd finished my apprenticeship, I would look for another career. So I was looking around, I finished my apprenticeship and then did a total change. I went into a state agency. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Started selling houses. I went from an oily uh, pair of overalls <laughs> to a double-breasted three-piece, double-breasted suit and a, a paisley tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, just thought I was the bee's knees for a bit. Saved a bit, bit of money. 
and bought my first Jaguar Mark II. So in front of us, we've got one, two, three Mark IIs. Yeah. So that's the sort of the beginning of this yes. real yeah. car journey. Yeah, so I had my first Jaguar Mark II when I was 18. Yeah. Um, it was just like that one. So what is it about the Mark II, apart from, I guess, the birdies in the Sweeney, which is how I always yeah, remember I the mean, Mark II's? Yeah, I mean, Jaguars, they're a prestigious car, um, and they were in my reach affordability, I guess. Um, I looked for an E-Type, even a basket case was like £2,000 when I was that age. Yeah. And on paper round money, I just thought there's no way I'm ever going to be able to afford an E-Type. I just can't. But a Mark II, you could pick them up reasonably cheaply. Yeah. Um, so I always wanted one. I was working in the garage. I was 18 years old and a car came in for an MOT and it failed. It was a, another a motor trader that wanted an MOT so we could sell it. And I said, well, how much, how much would you sell it to me for as it is with a no MOT? Yeah. He said £750. I said, done. I had £750 at the time, <laughs> so I bought a Mark II. I didn't tell my parents. My dad went nuts because he said, don't want you living at home for nothing and driving around in a Jaguar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he, didn't like, he didn't like it. And I wasn't allowed to bring it home. So I had to take it to my granddad where it, where it, where it all started. He, obviously, he liked cars, so he didn't mind. So I looked around and I tried to replace the car. And this is the closest I could get to replacing it. It's a 3.4 manual with steel wheels, but more or less identical to the car I had when I was 18. So... This is the car I've got a soft This spot represents for. <laughs> that car. <laughs> this represents in. this car. I and mean, you've got multiple yeah, other marks. I do. I was a, a Jaguar, Jaguar show, and this was an unfinished project uh, parked. And uh, Albert Powell was a, was a racing driver, was talking to the, um, the owner. And I was earwigging and uh, joined in the conversation, asked what was happening with the car and, and would it be for sale. And to cut a long story short, we struck up a bit of a deal, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to acquire it. So, yeah, it's a famous car. So it was one of the um, original touring cars from the 60s. Amazing. Um, there were Amazing. three sort of major teams. There was the Coombs uh, racing team, which was very successful. Um, Tommy Sopwith's Keep Endeavour team, which was very successful. And then this chap, no one really knew how he got in with Jaguar, this chap called uh, Peter Berry. And he formed a team, Peter Berry Racing Limited. Apparently he was friends with uh, Lofty England. So he was given a couple of Mark II Jaguars and a couple of E-Type Jaguars. Apparently he was sponsored by Castrol. Uh, the, the Jaguars had consecutive registration numbers. One BXV, two BXV, three BXV, four BXV. One and two being the Mark II, three and four being the E-Types. He was never really successful in a racing team, but had some very notable drivers. I mean, Bruce, Bruce McLaren has driven this car. I was just about to say that. Yeah. Surtees, yeah. Jack Sears, wow, Albert Powell, David Hobbs. I mean, yeah, just have Bruce all, McLaren and I mean, John yeah, Surtees. Yeah, I mean, they've, they, they've all driven this car. And, and there it is there in Aintree in 61, I believe. That's a great photo. With um, one, one BXV. I drove this around Goodwood in um, July of this year. Um, that was, uh, it, it was great to drive it. I actually enjoy driving it. It, it, it goes quite well. I bet it does. Um, if you need anyone to drive it for you, uh, I know a couple of people that are good at that sort of thing. Well, there you are. Mr. Yeah. Nadell, Mr. Plato. I'm well, sure there they'd you enjoy are. I actually it. would like somebody to, I, I would love to see this at Goodwood Revival. I, I don't have to be driving. Oh, I wouldn't be any good anyway. Yeah. Um, but it would be lovely to see this going around the track again. And I can prove the history for it. It's got, it's got a lot of history. It's great. Sirocco Mark II. Totally different to a Jaguar. Yeah, <laughs> totally different. <laughs> totally different. Well, when I gave up the motor trade, I became a, <laughs> became a, I went to retrain as a training negotiator, a company called Mann & Co Estate Agents. I was blasting up the A31 and needed something a bit more reliable. Well, the Golfs were out, cool hot hatches, yeah. and VWs were the thing then. Mm. Um, I started off with a Mark I Sirocco, fell in love with that, and then the, the Mark II GTI. I thought, wow. That's the car. The car I had was silver. I couldn't find a silver one, so um, I found this red one in, in, in beautiful condition. So it's just, just, just so many memories of, yeah. of me as a young lad. Let's have a look at that. We've got to look at the BMW. Let's look at the BMW. Yeah. I like the fact there's a veil. A veil. <laughs> the unveiling. The, beyond the veil the we un, have. The unveiling of the tip. So we've got three so, cars. Mark II, no, Mark 10. 
Yeah. Which I love. Yeah. Um, you've got an, a BMW over there, which yeah. is a... That's a 2002 Turbo, so uh, quite a rare car. Yeah. Yeah, I went to a New Year's, a New Year's Day meet at North Warmborough and uh, saw one parked there and I thought, oh, really nice. I wouldn't mind one of those. So uh, then, then Hank had the asked The seed one, was so. sown. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's getting there. It's... Um, it's a fair bit of work, but it's getting there. So this but, then, this, this bloody yeah, thing. Yeah, this thing. I know, it looks, I know it looks sad. Yeah, this is a BMW CSL Batmobile. I was driving around and uh, I saw a silver CSL BMW. I thought, wow, what a good looking car. Yeah. You know, that, that, is, that is beautiful. And mad for its time. I well, mean, yeah. A, a pure homologation tick box, really, with all these wings and... When BMW sold them, they weren't allowed to put the uh, wings and things on the car. That, that's right. They would come in the boot as a kit. So it was up to you whether you bolted them on. Of course, everybody did bolt them on. I wouldn't think anybody wouldn't because that was the, the whole idea. And apparently they, they, they built them to, to beat the Caprice. Yeah. But I was at the Festive Speed once and on the Cartier lawn <laughs> was a CSL Batmobile with the martini stripes and the big wings. And I thought, wow, what a... What a cracking looking car. Yeah. So what did I do? Got on the internet again. <laughs> you had a look. You're so addicted. Yeah, I know. Where can I find one of those? So I bought this one well, a number of years ago now in America. Um, and a genuine one of 60 something uh, left hand drive CSL Batmobiles. So quite a rare, valuable car. Uh, doesn't need to be like this. So um, that's why it's in the workshop here because it is slowly going going back together. So um, yeah, stunning looking car. I've got a picture there, Johnny, of what it, of what it might look like one day. So uh, <laughs> that's your inspiration. Yeah, that's my inspiration. I need to look at this and think that's, that's what you, uh, that's what you could have. So in these car cave episodes, we can't always feature all of the cars and do them all justice, which is a bit of a tragedy. And I, I do apologize for that. So don't shout at us, but we're going to try and have a whistle stop tour and mention all the cars right now with Michael, we're gonna start here with the BSA Bantam. I started off with bikes. Um, so my first bike was a step through on the C100 with a broken kickstart shaft that my granddad stripped down and, uh, and uh, we, we, got it, we got it running. Um, used to ride that around the garden. Then I went on to a Bantam, bought a D7 Bantam that we got running and I would ride it around the garden. So um, yeah. We got, I sold that years ago, but then this came up and I thought, oh, I used to have a Bantam. So, uh, so there you are, that's a... Uh, that's a late one on a J-Reg. Yeah, it's one of the last ones. Yeah. Mini. A Mini. Yes. Well, they're so iconic, aren't they? You, know, you, you, you must have a Mini. If you've got a car collection, you've got to have a Mini. Apparently so. So this one is a Cooper Sport 500. So it's one of the last 500 Minis ever made. Now, I quite like this one. It's in a rare, rare colour. Anthracite, yeah. it's a rare colour. It's a John Cooper garage supplied car. So it wasn't just one from any dealership. It actually came from John Cooper garages. It's got every bit of paperwork from when it was new, including the original bill of sale. Just quite a nice thing to have, uh, yeah. to have in a collection. I noticed it was on a Y-Ray, so I knew it was a late yeah, one, but I didn't realise it Yeah, was... one of the last. Yeah. Well, look, 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 the bloody DB5. This, they... is got, this is your most valuable car, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. It is actually for sale as well, so if anybody listening want, <laughs> if anybody listening wants it, they can buy it. That was just seamless. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Love that. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't ever think I'd have a DB5 Aston Martin. I just not in my wildest dreams. Um, but I, I, I bought bought this before they were worth the money they uh, they're worth now. When I bought it, it was original. Well, it wasn't. This was the original colour. But when I bought this car, it was Caribbean blue. Um, I didn't know it should have been Californian sage green, so I started taking a bit of trim apart and thinking, it's green. Um, Realised the original colour was Californian sage green, which actually is my favourite colour. So um, it's a great I, had colour. It, I had it repainted in, back in that colour. Changed the trim, uh, the colour was black, but now I've got a, a sage green trim. And I, think, I, think it looks, I think it looks very nice. It's flipping gorgeous. Yeah, beautiful looking thing. Yeah. XJS is more to the point, Michael. Bliminek, be still my beating heart. It's a Lynx Aventa. It is a Lynx Aventa. Yeah, and you're right. I flipping love, I love these coach built shooting quite, brakes. Quite, quite a rare car. Very unusual. And 
people are pleased to see it. People walk in this showroom and quite a few people say, oh, you know, this is nice, this is my favourite car. I've had people walk in saying, is it for sale? Is it for sale? Really? They're quite rare. They did 60 something of them um, and, and always create lots of attention yeah, you know, wherever is, they go. This is, this is one of my favourites you've got. I'm, I'm certain of it. Yeah. I think it's great. And then next to it is a, is a very cool... Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is an early car. Um, this is a pre-HE. So uh, this is launch year. So that would be 1975. Is, that, is it launch year? Is yeah, it a launch year car. This is unusual because this is one of 350 odd manual cars. There were 351, 352, something like that. Manual V12 cars. And this is a second manual car off the production line. So, okay, so uh, a really so early. Quite a, yeah, quite a rare thing. Um, obviously made famous by the Saint. Yes. And uh, as you can see on the decal. back, I, I, I uh, well, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I made the eBay purchase and, <laughs> and stuck it on the back. So uh, it's, a, it's a cool thing. I just though. like the matte black on the, uh, on the boot. Next to another white Jag. And yeah, another, another white, white Jag. And a manual, another white manual. Yes. I have never driven a manual early XJ6, but I have a feeling that it would be a cool thing. Yeah, they drive well. I mean, yeah. The, uh, yeah, I mean, the Jaguar put a lot of money into sorting the handling out of these cars. Uh, manual cars are quite fun to drive, a bit more spirited, um, so a little bit more popular. Um, yeah, a nice, a nice car. Right, Escort Mexico. Escort Mexico. It has Jack Brabham's name on it. It has, this is a bit of a special Escort Mexico. So uh, I didn't expect to be owning one with such pedigree. I used to have one when I, back, in, back in the day when they were cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I had an Escort Mexico, I had a Group 1 RS2000 engine in. It used to go like the clappers and I used to love it. So anyway, I sold that to buy the first Mark II Jaguar. And we thought, oh, that was a nice car, I like the Mexico. And they became more sort of iconic. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of looked for a Mexico. I remember seeing this car. It was at auction, supposedly a Jack Brabham racing car. And it sold, it was quite a lot of money, and ended up in the uh, collection of JD Classics. Right. Fast forward a few years, uh, I was walking around the race retro show, and this was on a stand. And I walked up to the guy and said, um, I, I'm sure it said for sale. I'm pretty sure it did say for sale. Uh, you know, I said, uh, how come you've got this car? I thought JD Classics owned it. Um, and he was a little bit cagey to start with, but then he said, well, um, I've got it on my stand. I used to own it when I, was, um, when, I was, when I was a kid. We didn't know what it was then. We found out after watching a YouTube clip that this was the Jack Brabham car. He said that I've got it on my stand, but there's a very rare engine that I have um, that they want for one of their valuable racing cars. And the upshot of it is we can do a bit of a deal. Um, so I was quite intrigued with this. And I said, well, actually, I've got an Escort Mexico. I had a white one that need, needed restoration. But, uh, you know, again, another project that am I going to get around to doing? So I started chatting. And in the end, we did a part exchange. He said, well, I can get this car. I said, well, I've got this car that needs restoring. He said, well, I would still like a Mexico. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so he did an exchange. So I got one done. He got a project. And needless to say, I had to put money money of with it of course um, so this was a was raced yeah by Jack. well only one race so basically there was a support race before a grand prix and ford took around about 20 odd escort mexicos off the production line they were all consecutive hla numbers okay so they're identical cars so F formula one team bosses and managers had a thrash around the, uh, the circuit before the, the start of the Grand Prix. And Jack Brabham actually won in this very car. And I see, I'm seeing there's that magazine on the, there on is. the driver's yeah, seat. That, yeah, that's interesting. That's Bit of history it. that goes with the car. And there's the car. On three wheels. This is the only Ferrari you've got? Yes, it and, is. And it's the most modern car you've got? And the most modern car I've yeah. got, yeah. It's, it's most schoolboy's dream, isn't it, to have mm. a Ferrari? Yeah. Um, so I think if you've got a car collection, that has to feature. Um, why do I like this one? Because it's the last proper manual car. Yep. Um, there's a six speed manual transmission, H gate. So this was the last production car with a manual gearbox that Ferrari made. Yeah. So after this came the 575, they did a couple of manuals and now they're quite expensive, but yep. most of them were the Tiptronic. So this is the last proper manual car Ferrari made. I really like the, the, the sort of front engine, the proportion. Big, big bonneted. Yeah, yeah, I remember when the- It is nice. And it's, it's part nice next to 
probably the, the least powerful car well, yeah. that you own. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Ripple Bonnet 2CV. Yeah. You know, who would have thought I'd have... Can I, like, can I do yeah, the shake? You can, yeah, don't, it, might, the, it might fall over. <laughs> I'm not even, honestly, I'm not even trying. It's an, it's an early car. I and mean, look at the doors that open this way. Well, they call them suicide doors. Yeah. And then if you look at the upholstery, I mean, you get stronger deck chairs than that. This is immaculate, Michael. It is. It's a beautiful car. Yeah, this is mint. I mean, I don't know why I've got it. I mean, when I was younger, I hated them. If you had a 2CV, you were like a, uh, a school teacher or a hippie or, or, yeah, or something. Yeah, or, or there something, were all those. Or something like that. But, you know, um, you know, and now I've got a 2CV featuring in the car collection. What the hell is this a doing brick. here? Again, well, you've got a, brick. A brick. you've got a brick. You've got a 244. Well, yeah, because, you know, when I was driving around in Jaguar, it was old men that had these. And, you know, oh, he's boring. He's got a Volvo. <laughs> You know, it, Captain so, Safe yeah, over there. Yeah, that's that, that's right. You know, it's it, it's you know, what's he got one of those horrible Volvos for? But a few years on, you look at it now and think, oh, I remember those driving around when I was a kid. And you, then you start looking at think, you actually they're quite cool, really. They're not that bad. Yeah. And then you end up falling in love with one. What one in your collection? Yeah. It is actually quite bizarre. It is, but, isn't uh, it? Yeah. Um, S2000. Yes. So. I'll start by saying the man behind the camera lens there, Phil, he used to have one of these. Did he? I think he really? regrets selling it. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I remember when they came out, they were quite a cool looking convertible car that, well, they used to rev to 9,000 revs. Yeah. And that was the appeal, the VTEC engine. Yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily want one. Um, my brother plays golf with a chap that, uh, that bought it for his wife. He wouldn't let his wife drive it. What? He wasn't allowed to go on any country lane. It wasn't allowed to go out in the wet. And it's only done 11,500 miles. Has it? Yeah, it's a very low mileage. It and it's extremely that. clean. I mean, it's a beautifully clean car. Yeah. Um, so my brother rang me and said, oh, uh, chap at the golf club here has got an S2000. He knows you're into classic cars. Would you be interested in it? And I thought, well, a bit new. Not really. Not really my thing. But I went to look at it, and it's absolutely mint. It was supplied at a garage down the road, Alan Day Honda, which is now Waitrose, I think. And the salesman's cards in the, uh, in the um, history pack. And I went to school with the salesman. Did you? He, was a, he started as a mechanic. Um, and then he went into sales. And it was funny to see his cards. So it was one. Or I, it, I, just, it, it, I can't believe The condition it sold it to I, me. What a cool thing. Phil, yeah. you can't buy it. But we're going to go across to there now, because I've had my eye on this since we walked into your amazing car barn. Yeah, 356 three, three, five, Porsche. So this is an interesting car. I was, and I shall tell you why. You, I was, you, is it to do with... You haven't got, yeah, I know. You, <laughs> you spotted it. I did. I, I look, when I looked at it, I went, it looks really sparse. There's yeah, no overriders. Yeah. There's no round all here. Yes, no, yeah, yeah. No, you've spotted it. What's the score? Well, I was told that it was ordered like that. And we didn't necessarily, we thought, no, it can't have been ordered like that. You know, it would have had some badges. And I even went to the uh, techno, the, the show at Essen, yeah. the classic car show at Essen, and bought a load of, well, they're in the back there, you can see them. I bought all the badges. Oh, yeah. So I, bought bought the, I bought all the badges. I bought an SC badge. I bought the Porsche badge to go on the front. And I was going to put them all on. Um, then I went through the history file. There's a box of history, including the original bill of sale, all written in German. Yeah. And we translated it. And on the bill of sale, it was ordered in slate grey with no badges and no overriders. It's not an SC. The engine checks out as an SC, but it's not an SC. It's a C, but it was ordered with an SC engine. How odd. And I believe it's a 65 car, 64, 65. So it would have been one of the last... Yeah, the and, last it, and a sunroof. I think it's just so interesting. It is. It's, it's just it's so great, odd. It's a great shape. They call it the jelly mould. Yeah, it is the yeah, jelly mould. It is. It's, it's a lovely shape. It's, honestly, to this day, I get asked, what is the best looking car of all time? And I often go to the original 356 jelly mould. I go, it's the silhouette is just amazing. So we're going to go from jelly mould to shark. Yes, to the shark. M6. M635 CSI. Um, so in my early days, when I was a Jaguar man, didn't like these. No, I don't want any German. <laughs> what? Don't want any German Vulgar. rubbish. No, Vulgar. I, don't, I don't want any German rubbish. Don't like those BMWs. Um, but I did really. I just, <laughs> I just pretended I didn't. I didn't like them. Has this been restored? 
No, this is original. Is it? So I bought this off of the original owner. Again, a great big box of history, his original form when he ordered it and ticked the boxes, what colours he wanted, then the bill of sale, all the service books. And it's done 40 something thousand miles. Goodness gracious. It's not, I, I haven't done a thing to it. Um, Man, this is amazing. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go from massive BMW to a tiny Fiat to 500. To tiny Fiat 500. Why have I got that? And why do I have a tiny Fiat 500? They're just funny, aren't they? Yeah. You know, everyone smiles when you're, when you're in them. And but, you, I've just noticed yours is right-hand drive. It is unusual. So it's a UK car? Yeah, a UK right-hand drive car. I love them. I, I had one and I regret selling it. And then I had a Fiat 126 that was immaculate and I sold it and I regret that as well. But we yeah. won't talk about that. So we're going to go from tiny little car to, to big, big car. Obviously, early Range Rover, and yes. I do like the early Range, especially yeah. in the sort of British Leylandy colours. Yeah, Bahama Gold, they call yeah. this. Yeah, not gold, obviously. Banana, but... yeah, banana Gold, Bahama Gold. Yeah. Um, this doesn't look restored. No, it's not restored. And that was part of the appeal with it. You know, these came out in 1970, a long time ago now. Yes, could do with the tailgate painting, but I think... It kind of would be a shame to paint it, oh, it, I, is, it is very original. I'd have to strike you off my list if you painted <laughs> this. You don't see these. You, no, you don't. You do not see a Gordon Keeble ever, really. Not very many of them. Well, actually, the survival rate is very good. Um, so 99 of them were built, and then with a lot of leftover parts, they managed to string a 100th one together, <laughs> so 100 in total. Um, this is chassis number 20. Um, but surprisingly, out of the 100 cars, 80-odd still survive. Wow. They, survive. they didn't rust. They were fiberglass. Yeah. I mean, they're unusual. Um, they're a space frame construction. Yeah. Dijon rear axle and a Chevy V8 engine. Yeah. So they go very, very well. And the reason why there were so few, it wasn't the fact they weren't popular. There were full order books for them. But unfortunately, there was problems with getting parts, industrial action. There were full order books, cars lined up but without parts to fit them. Yeah. So unfortunately, it's a sad story. Uh, the company went into liquidation having, having made, sold 99 cars. If, if there was one car in this room which put, points you out as being a quirky connoisseur of vehicles <laughs> it has to be this, this one really well because that badge most people don't yeah. know what the hell it is no they think it's a bristol they think it might be a weird well that's right italian bodied aston or something nobody really i mean the reason the reason the, the appeal of this to me uh, being interested in cars was the fact it was just built eight miles down the road from winchester where we are yeah so the early cars were built at the airport eastly um Hence the, uh, hence, the, hence the sign in the background. That's um, an original sign. That is the original, well, one of the original signs that came from the railway station at Eastleigh. This is special. <laughs> this is a special car. We're in the American side now. We are, aren't old, we? Yeah, the old stars and stripes and a couple of American cars at the back. So, yeah, you know, again, wasn't really interested in American cars when I was younger. You just used to think were big sloppy useless things um, <laughs> but <laughs> here now, we are now here we, are here we are so we started getting interested in mustangs um and went to florida on a bit of a trip and came back with this one um a 65 fastback yeah uh was originally wimbledon white um but it was uh, painted this uh, shelby color almost and a lovely original nicely nice car for an american car they were fairly compact yeah they which are. is probably why i like it it's not too big it's not too big doesn't take up too much room ah but talking about something that's big yeah this is massive <laughs> that is big looks really well preserved as well yeah it's an arizona car so although it's got patina it, it really isn't rusty um so i bought this thinking this was going to be my pickup of choice to drive so You'll probably see the blue Mazda outside. I did see the blue Mazda outside. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a 52 plate uh, B2500 Mazda that I bought brand new and I've done more miles in that than anything. Um, it's a bit beaten about. Um, so I thought, I know, I'm going to get this American truck and drive that around. That's, that's going to be cool. But it's at the back of the showroom because there's a lot of narrow roads around here and it's 
pretty challenging to drive that on the narrow road, <laughs> especially when the number seven bus comes in the opposite direction. <laughs> so you've got, you got, you got a Stang there, then the pickup, the Ford, yeah. and then another Stang. Yes. I, I saw this advertised online. I thought, that's a nice car. Yeah. Sent the guy a deposit. Yeah. Um, arranged a bit of a road trip out there with my brother. Um, and it was quite a, a, an impressive setup. The guy had all sorts of cars, but he'd just taken on the blue fastback. When I looked at the blue fastback, I thought, oh, I prefer that. That one there? Yeah, yeah. So you, you... I'd, already, I'd already sort of committed <laughs> to buying this. So, you, um, so, you... so in the end, I came away with two. You, you bought both of them? Uh, yeah, as you do. You're a bad um, man. I know, you I know. Are. Well, that, that was, yes, that wasn't, <laughs> yeah. So, so there you go, the two Mustangs. So um, one for every occasion. A similar, well, slightly similar. I'm colour blind. Slightly yeah. similar colour to the to the Similar Aston. colour, yeah. I think, I, I, think, I think this one's actually called Winchester Red. Really? Fittingly, yeah, I believe so. I just love the shape of it. It's, it, it, it's, it's an aggressive, muscly car. Yeah. That's what I like about it. It's got it's got the it's got the yeah the large the, the large scoops and I always thought that the creases were ever so sharp on these yeah the, there was a there was a, a I can't remember one of the James Bond films when he drove one this shape I think it's in the Beauty Motor Museum at the moment yeah it was it a metallicy grey yeah Living Daylights Timothy Dalton is it? yeah it's the one with the skis on the side oh is he it? goes down a ski slope in it I'm okay. sure he does. We're going to have a quick look in the other sheds now, which are not as glamorous as these, but the cars are still interesting, really interesting. Now, I wasn't expecting to see one of these. No, quite a rare thing. That's a really rare thing. Yeah, so when I finished my apprentice, well, during my, my apprenticeship, the garage had a Fiat Hire car department, and there was one of these on the fleet. And every opportunity I got to drive it, I just couldn't wait any excuse to drive the above. <laughs> I mean, they were really quick in their day. They, they still are quite quick. They are. Um, as you can see, the building is in the throes of being constructed. It's not finished. Yeah. So hence the cars are looking a little bit sorry for themselves, but they'll clean up. This, uh, again. Hot hatch. Was not expecting you no. to own one of these. Well, I just got into hot hatches. And uh, as again, this is a rust-free car. Came from, it was a UK right-hand drive car. The lady owner went to live in the south of France. It's still original on its French registration plate. Right. So it's a nippy little A86, A A82, it's not the 86, A82 Toyota. Yeah. 1.6 Twinker. And continuing the, the sort of hot hatchy thing. Yes. Well, I mean, we've got not this, because that's not a hot hatch. No, it's... no, this is an imposter. What's that doing? <laughs> What's that doing here? But not another is... Jaguar. Another XJ, wow. another manual XJ. Yes, yes. Um, so... I had this car for a number of years, then the white XJ came along that's in the showroom, yeah. a very low 15,000 mile for a new car. So I bought that with a view to selling this one to get some of the money back. So that's the story with this but one. But you haven't but, uh, sold it yet. Not <laughs> yet. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Love this. It's coming. Love it's it. coming. <laughs> Maestro Turbo, MG Maestro. I actually did a barn find on one of these and it was surprisingly popular in the comments because yeah. I think finally that you know they, they they've they've not really seen the respect and the the love that f fast forwards Golf GTIs. No, they haven't. I came. But across you the, have. Got yeah, I mean, I came across this first of all a Montego Turbo. I love. I thought, the how rare is that? You just don't see a Montego Turbo. No. Nope. So I bought this and thought, well, I better get a Maestro next. So I looked for a Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> you are terrible. <laughs> I know. You're terrible. But then I can't have. These two without the metro. So okay. I look for a metro and then another shed, there's a metro. So I've got the You've set. Got, oh, you, and you eventually, when this is finished, yeah, you'll the, have them. The idea is this, this, this will be a, a second showroom. <laughs> right, another shed. Another shed, more projects, <laughs> project shed. Um, so I guess this is the most unusual project in here. And um, two right. What a thing. What is it? I know. Well, a lot of people don't know what it is. Well, <laughs> I was looking at this mad back window and I was looking at that beautiful shaped arch. And I had to say, I looked at the badge and I'm still a little bit in the dark. Yeah, what is it? Coupe FT Tuccini. Yes, yes. If you look at the front, there's a leaping cat on the front, which gives it away that it might be something to do with Jaguar. 
Right. So a bit of an interesting story. The Tarcini family were importers of Jaguar into Italy. They used to import quite a few and they had it in their minds that they would like to do a Italian style Jaguar. So they asked Jaguar for a few um, bits and pieces to build their own car. Yeah. They did two. They did one on a Jaguar 420 and one on an S-Type. This is the 420. Now, they kept this one in the family. This is a Geneva Motor Show car. They sold the S-Type version to a wealthy Italian. And this is the second car, so one of, one of two in the world. So this was the Motor Show car? This is a Geneva Motor Show car that, that came direct from the family. And so they, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the second owner after the Tarcini family. Seriously, and bloody hell, they only <laughs> made two of them. They made two. Well, Michael, the fact, it makes my day, the fact that even if I just saw the Gordon Keeble, this, and I don't know. And the fact that this is part next to a Metro GTI. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love car eccentricity. You know that. I love, <laughs> I love coming to see your barns full of cars today. The cars that you haven't quite got around to restoring. The ones no. that you bought one and then you bought another one that's similar. Everything's got a story. Everything's got a reason. It is a, it is a bit mad. <laughs> It is an illness, John. <laughs> it is. We said that at the beginning. We did. It's certainly an illness. It's an illness, but it's a wonderful one. And I hope that you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have walking around Michael's barns. Um, if you have a car barn like this that you think is good enough for us to come and film, please get in touch with us. There's a link in the description below. This is the car out of all of Michael's that has the most miles put on it on a weekly by, basis. By me, yeah. And People you've owned it from you. I've had this new, yeah, people say to me, well, do you drive all these cars in the barn? Uh, sometimes, but this one, this is my everyday work This is course. the one, keeping had, it real. Had it from new. With the Mazda B2. More miles than this than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say a massive thank you to Carly for sponsoring this episode. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to The Late Break Show, I urge you to, or have a look at our playlist with all the other car caves that I've visited previously. Thank you. Thank you.